Now they're beating the dog. The youth of Showwater Bay Reservation are interested in le learning about their heritage and how they can help retain the Indian identity in a fast pro um, progressing world through counseling and teaching the young people to be proud of their reservation <laughs> and heritage we feel we have. That one was hard. <laughs> Let's try it again. The youth of Showwater Bay Reservation are interested in leaving, learning, yeah, yeah. The youth of Showwater Bay Reservation are interested in learning about their heritage and how they can help retain the Indian identity in a fast progressing world. Through counseling and teaching the young people to be proud of their reservation and heritage, we feel we are moving in the right direction. <laughs> I was trying to move it up and hold it long enough for her to continue on. Northwest Coast or... Did you want to use a cassette on this too? Mm, I don't think so. Okay. This tribe is de the descendants of the once powerful nation of Chinooks who were headquartered on the Columbia River at what is now the town of Chinook. At one time there were over 40 Indian villages within Pacific County. These villages were made up of Chinook, Chehalis, and Hump Tulips Indians. Statistics from various explorers range anywhere from the tens of thousands to mere handfuls. James G. Swan, who lived on the harbor from 1852 to 1855, states in his book, The Northwest Coast, or Three Years Residence in Washington Territory, the relics of old lodges, canoes, heaps of shells, and other remains give evidence that at some period, there must have been a large body of Indians around Showwater Bay. The sea provided the economy for these early Indians. Again, Swan mentions in his book of the abundance of resources they derived from the sea. At low tide, the flats and shoals are all bare. The shoals are covered with shellfish, among which the oyster is the most abundant and constitutes the principal article of export. Several varieties of clams, crabs of the largest size and of a most delicious flavor, shrimps, mussels, and small species of sand lobster are in the greatest abundance and furnish nutritious food not only to the different tribes of Indians who resort to the bay at different seasons to procure supplies, but also to the white settler. The water of the bay and all the streams that enter into it are well stocked with fish. Salmon of several varieties abound and are taken in great numbers by the f Indians for their own food or for trading with the whites. Sturgeon of a very superior quality are plenty and for a principal item in the stock of provisions the Indians lay by for their winter use. The rivers and mountain streams abound in trout. Flatfish such as turbot, Soles and flounders are plenty, and in the spring, innumerable shoals of herring visit the bay and are readily caught by the Indians, either with nets or in weirs and traps rudely constructed of 
twigs. The feathered tribe are numerous and during the season flock hither in clouds. White and black swans, white geese, Canada geese, brant, sheldrake, cormorants, loon, mallard ducks, redhead, gray pigeons, and robins. During the summer month, months, pelican are plenty and go sailing round in their heavy, lazy flight, occasionally dasking into the water in the most clumsy manner to catch a fish. And at all times an easy prey and an acceptable banquet to the Indians, who swallow their coarse, fishy, oily flesh with the greatest avidity. Innumerable flocks of gulls of various species are constantly to be seen, and at times, when attracted by any quantities of food, appear like clouds. These birds also are readily eaten by the Indians, who never are at a loss to find means to appease their appetite. Porpoises and seals are plenty in the bay, and the latter are very, very easily killed either with spears or by shooting. Their flesh, particularly the young ones, is very palatable, and their blubber makes excellent oil, which is eaten by the Indians. Whales are frequently thrown ashore on the beach bordering the Pacific during the winter and spring months, and their blubber forms an important article of diet with the natives. The salmon, seal, and whale oils form the same important part of the domestic economy of the coast Indian as lard, butter, or olive oil do with the whites. And the Indian who has not at all times in his lodge a good supply of oil or blubber not only feels very poor, but is so considered by his acquaintance and friends. <clears throat> it appears to me as if Showwater Bay is an Indian's paradise. There is no time of year excepting winter, and only a short time then. But what a plenty of food can be obtained by anyone who is not too lazy to go out for it. In the 1800s, smallpox epidemic seriously reduced the native population along the coast between the Columbia River and the Strait of Juan de Fuca. The Showwater Bay area was one of the hardest hit by this disease. Some of the villages around Showwater Bay virtually depopulated, and the few survivors going to live with neighboring people. Although there have been two attempts, the Showwater Bay Indian tribe does not have a treaty with the United States government. In the 1840s, Doc Dr. Anson Dart attempted to make a purchase of their lands at the mouth of Columbia, but he was so totally unfitted for the duties of the office that his treaty was instantly turned down at Washington. Governor Isaac Stevens tried again on February 25, 1855, but his, this attempt also failed. The Showwater Bay Indian Reservation was established by executive order in 1866 in order to secure home to local resident Indians who refused to leave the area. The government, government attempted for over a decade to induce these people to consent to removal to some other location. It was hoped to combine them with Quinault Indians on a reservation in Quinault Territory north of Grays Harbor. Failing this, it was hoped that they could be located with Lord Chehalis people on a pr proposed reservation, Black River. Both of these were river locations. Government intent was that those locales would provide both fisheries and opportunity for agricultural development. The Showwater Bay people were marine rather than riverine people. They made a use of the rivers which drained into the bay, but the tidelands provided such an easily accessible and rich harvest area that their primary dependence and interest was in marine rather than riverine fisheries. They stubbornly refused to abandon their traditional living sites and traditional fisheries. When the government realized that they could not mo remove, be removed from Showwater Bay, the Indian Reservation was finally established. It was located, it is located at what is, was one of the traditional Showwater Bay village sites. The old Indian village was called Monolumsh, 
the white settler named the place Georgetown. In records of eight, the 1860s, the reservation is often referred to as the Georgetown Indian Reservation. Although the reservation was established by executive order in 1866, it was not recognized by the Secretary of Interior, who represents the United States as a, a legal entity until 1971. At the present, the tribal enrollment of the Showater Bay Indian Tribe is 86 members. It is the, among the smallest of the state of Washington. Of the 86 members, only 26 live or adjacent to the reservation. That number would be much higher if there were adequate housing available. The governing body of the tribe is the Tribal Council, which is made up of Chairwoman Rachel Whitish, Vice Chairman Bruce Davis, Secretary Hazel McKinney, and a Treasurer and Member at Large, which will be filled at a special election to be held in the near future. Rachel White is Showwater Bay Indian Tribal Chairwoman, lived in Seattle for about 18 years, but was born and raised here on Showwater Bay. Rachel said that since she was a child, things have changed a lot. For instance, there used to be a lot more people, there were no electricity or plumbing, and of course there were no cigarette stands. When Rachel was a child, she lived with her grandma, Carol, and her grandpa, George Charlie. Rachel's grandfather owned a lot of horses and buggies. He also had a dock and boathouse. Their first car was a Model T owned by her uncle Mitchell. She was six or seven when her uncle took her to Aberdeen because she couldn't get along with other children because of her lame leg. Traveling to Aberdeen and back took a full day's drive. The Y by the state park was all plank road. Only one car could go on it at a time. Also, Rachel said that by the Bay City Bridge, which wasn't there then, there was a barge-like ferry that carried people and cars across the water. Rachel said that since their main that Rachel said that their main diet on Showwater Bay was fish, clams, and oysters. The slough used to be deep enough for fishing boats to come into George Charlie's dock and boathouse. There used to be a Shaker church around Showwater Bay in one of the fields. Rachel said that in those days they didn't have certain traditions, just love and respect for their elders. When asked what her goals are for the tribe, Rachel said, to benefit all tribal members, and I would like to have a community center built to be proud of, and I, ha I have hopes of bringing our people closer together. The only economy dr derived on the reservation at this time were two sm are two smoke shops, owned and operated by Doug Davis and Myrtle Landry. The once great abundance of marine resources have vanished, an extensive search was made in 1974 of the remaining reservation sand flats and tidal channel banks, but no shellfish or any kind were found except very large numbers of sand shrimp. The old ways are still kept by many tribal members. Lorraine Anderson finds beadwork enjoyable, relaxing, and profitable. She learned the ancient art from Mary Frank of Nisqually and Maybelle Thomas of Tohola. Lorraine has been doing beadwork most, almost daily for 15 years. Much of Lorraine's work, most of which are her own designs, including headbands, hatbands, chokers, necklaces, watch bands, earrings, neckties, belts, hair ties, and beaded bags, are sold at the Teepee Village, one of the reservation smoke shops, and from her home in Seattle. Lorraine is also very interested in teaching beadwork, especially to the young people. Besides being an inexpensive art form, she says that it's not difficult to learn. The young people on the reservation are deeply interested in their heritage. Each summer, many of the tribal members' children move to the reservation in order to work on the summer youth pro project which is supervised and coordinated by Joanne Rosander. Joanne works out a program each year that will be both profitable to the reservation and educational to the young people. This summer's largest project has been the gardens, which has 
have been divided into age group plots, older and younger children. The land the gardens are situated on has not been used for 30 years, so needless to say they have bus been busy fighting weeds. Among the produce planted are strawberries, tomatoes, cucumbers, squash, peas, corn, beans, potatoes, radishes, and carrots. It was decided by the general council that after harvesting the crops, the young people could sell the produce and use the profit for next year's youth program. Besides the garden, garden project, they have partially cleared the reservation cemetery, a job that was started last year. They also make sure that litter is picked up along the highway and beaches within the reservation. Another program that Joanne Rosander has been trying to start is a Showwater Bay Indian language course. This would be taught by Mrs. Irene Shale. Irene has known the Showwater Bay Indian language since she was born. She was raised speaking the English and Indian language. She feels that the language fits the history of Showwater Bay somehow. Irene has never taught anybody the language except she used to talk to her grandchildren in Indian and they learned bits and pieces. She wants to teach a class of people the Indian language so that it may be passed on. Irene, her sister Nina Bumgarner, and a man named Henry Culty are the last and only people living who know the whole Showwater Bay language. <clears throat> the language, says Irene, is not too hard to learn, not as hard as others. She would like to teach people four years of age and up. That way they can all help each other out and learn more. She would like to teach orally and written. She said that if a person wants to know the language, he wants to know the history too. Our plans for the future of our tribe depends on the correcting of past experiences. By trying to gain the ear of the governmental bodies which can help us shape our future will be the task that myself and members of my tribe must correct. Problems with jurisdiction, erosion, pollution, and economic self-sufficiency are what my tribe has to do to deal with before the future can be assured. This is room ambience. It's just over 15 minutes. Check your burn out there. I'm trying to get some room ambience shut up. Oh. 